All right. Uh, it's three past the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us today. Uh, welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Navigating the Sea of Local Kubernetes Clusters. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Sika. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat and a CNCF ambassador. Uh, I'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, we would like to welcome our presenter today, Otto Polito, uh, developer advocate at Datadog. A uh, few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page uh, at a link that we'll put in the chat, but at cncf.io slash webinars. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Ada to kick off today's presentation. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, so yeah, today, thanks for joining. Today we are going to be uh, trying to help you navigate the sea of Kubernetes local clusters. Uh, so you may be new um, to Kubernetes or fairly new. You're still learning how to deploy your applications in Kubernetes, and you would like to get um, a local cluster running in your laptop, in your workstation to help you deploy those applications and test those applications. And you may be wondering uh, what you should use. So this is what we are going to try to help you make a decision with today. Um, so Datadog is a monitoring and analytics platform that helps companies improve observability of their infrastructure and applications, including Kubernetes, of course, uh, the cluster itself, uh, but also the applications that are running inside your cluster. Uh, this is not a talk about Datadog itself, but just so you know um, where I work. So I'm a developer advocate there at Datadog. I've been working on Kubernetes projects for the past three years. Um, I'm a certified Kubernetes administrator, and I was also part of the team that created the curriculum and exam for the certified Kubernetes application developer. Uh, both are certifications by the CNCF and the Linux Foundation. And uh, those are two ways to contact me. You can DM me or ping me on Twitter. Uh, that's my handler, um, and that is also my mail. So if you have any questions or you want to follow up um, afterwards, uh, feel free to, to reach out on either of those two mediums. But uh, this is a talk about Kubernetes. What is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is an orchestration platform for your containerized application. So basically, it's going to help you run uh, your containers and your applications as containers uh, in production. Uh, it's completely open source. It's a graduated CNCF project. And it's a super successful open source project. So it's had, had 19 major releases in 2015 when it was first released. Um, it has more than 90,000 commits on its repo from more than 2,000 contributors. So huge successful um, open source project, but it's not only successful um, as the project itself. Um, it's also very popular and it's increasing popularity. So for a user point of view, um, this is the Google Trends searches for Kubernetes from 2015, mid 2015, more or less, until January this year. So as you can see, it's a, it's a trend that keeps on growing and probably is going to continue that way for a while. Why? Why it's so popular? Why companies are choosing Kubernetes for their containerized applications? Um, so first of all, uh, it's super extensible and flexible because everything is going to be API driven. So everything in Kubernetes is an API object uh, that you interact with, um, but also that API is extensible. So if you want to create a new object uh, to solve an issue that you have particular on your space, you can do so. So it's super extensible. Uh, the second reason obviously is its large community. Uh, as we can see, there is a lot of companies putting a lot of uh, effort and developing effort to, to Kubernetes. So new features, bug fixes, et cetera, um, get ready very quickly. So uh, something to take, to take into account. 
And another reason is it helps with your multi-cloud strategy. So if you want to run your application on several clouds, um, if you have this extra abstract abstraction layer uh, with Kubernetes between your application and the cloud, it may help you uh, migrate those applications between the different clouds. So this is fantastic. Uh, it's a great uh, production environment, but what about the developer experience? Um, how does that matches that great production environment? Um, so this is how your um, production cluster may look like. Um, maybe this is way too, too abstract, but you get the idea. Um, maybe this is a le less abstract. So in your production cluster or your staging cluster, uh, you will have several nodes. Uh, each of those is going to be running different workloads. Um, and each of those nodes are going to be connected to each other through the network. All in all, so what we are trying to say is your production cluster is a distributed system. And as a distributed system, um, it has um, its own needs that, that we need to, to take into account. Um, but then your workstation looks like this. And um, the, these workstations that we have as developers um, are actually very powerful. They have several cores, uh, they have a lot of memory, uh, and they're getting better and better every time. So with those powerful work, workstations that we have, are we able to kind of mimic um, what we have in production with in our own laptop? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, production, your production is never going to be, a, be the same as your local cluster. Um, as we said, it's a distributed system. Um, it might be running on bare metal, or might be running on a cloud with its own different things. Uh, so it's never going to be the same experience. And that's something that obviously we need to acknowledge, we need to take into account. Uh, so now that we know that it's never going to be the same, um, is it still worth running a Kubernetes cluster in your workstation? Uh, so I think the answer is yes, because if not, I wouldn't obviously be giving this talk. And why I think it's useful. Um, many things. So first of all, it's a great learning tool. So if you, if you want to start deploying your applications in Kubernetes, uh, you need a way to learn how to work with Kubernetes. You need a, a way to learn uh, how to create a deployment object, how to create a pod, um, how to, <clears throat> sorry, how to create a service, what uh, the different type of services that we have. Um, all of that um, you will need to, to learn and having a local cluster may help you learning all these concepts very, very easily. Uh, the second is it has a very quick feedback loop. So if you have an application that you want to run quickly on Kubernetes cluster, you can try that on your own workstation with one of these solutions. And it's also very useful for CI CD workflows. So if you have an application that you want to test in a Kubernetes cluster before shipping that application, we will see some of these solutions are very good to be able to spin up very quickly a cluster, turn it down, um, have several combinations of versions of Kubernetes, for example. So it's very useful as well for your CI um, uh, pipelines. Okay, so first, before we dive in into this uh, sea of local clusters, um, we, we just uh, said that uh, basically what we're doing here is talking about containers. And when we talk about containers, uh, if we are not um, specifying the type of containers, if we are not saying if it's something else, what we mean uh, is that we're talking about Linux containers. Obviously, there are other types of containers like Windows containers, but in general, when we talk about containers, we are talking about Linux containers. And um, that's uh, something that obviously changes everything because if you're not running Linux um, natively in your workstation, everything that we are going to learn here today is going to be uh, virtualized. And it's okay. And we, we are going to see some of the examples 
uh, that we are going to see some of them are, are going to be very transparent uh, how they manage the virtualization and some of them are going to be less transparent uh, it's going to be um, more specific uh, but in from a technical point of view all of all of this if you're not running linux is going to be virtualized Okay, so um, let's try to, to navigate that sea of local Kubernetes clusters. The goal of this webinar is not to tell you what you should use. The goal of this webinar is to give you an idea of the difference between the technical point of view and the user uh, experience point of view of these tools, uh, so you can make your own decision of what is best for your use case um, or if you want to try several ones, depending on, on the several uh, scenarios that you have. So these are the ones that we are going to see, the five slash six that we are going to see today um, are Minikube, Kind, uh, Micro Kubernetes, K3S and K3D, and those two are very connected, so that's why I put them together. Um, and Firecube, which is a little bit different, but I thought it was, it was interesting to, to put here in the list as well. Okay, but before we, we go into each of those, uh, I think it's important to mention Cube ADM, um, which is a, a project inside Kubernetes to help you create a Kubernetes cluster in an easier way. Uh, so the everything that you have to do from an admin point of view of adding nodes, managing certificates, all of that, um, Cube ADM helps you with that. You don't have to know what it could from a developer point of view, what Cube ADM is, um, but many of these tools are uh, based on Cube ADM, so are using Cube ADM to actually create the cluster. Um, so I thought it was interesting to just mention it. So in case you see on some of the output something related to Cube ADM, um, you know what it is. Okay, so let's start diving in. Uh, the first one that we are going to see is Minikube, and the reason why we are studying with Minikube is because it's the most popular one. When you start with Kubernetes, probably the first thing that you do is installing Minikube. Why it's so popular? Um, so one of the reasons why it's so popular is because it has been around for quite a while. Um, the project started in 2016, just a year after the first Kubernetes release. Um, it provides you with a single node cluster, uh, and it's also cross-platform in Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. And in, in those three, um, it, the user experience is exactly the same because in those three, it's going to be virtualized and, and we will see a little bit um, in a while how. A another uh, good feature that it has is that it follows Kubernetes releases uh, very, very closely. So as soon as there is a new Kubernetes release, a day or a couple of days after, you're going to see a new Minikube release that supports that new version. So it's, it's really straightforward to be running the latest uh, Kubernetes release. It also supports a lot of uh, features, night like features that you want to learn when you're learning Kubernetes, like uh, load balancer and node port services, ingress, uh, different container runtimes. Uh, so it has a lot of those nice features that can help you um, test and learn those concepts. And, and it also has an uh, add-ons um, based service where you can add more stuff to your, to your cluster, things like metric server or ingress, things like that. Uh, you can add those um, installing, enabling those add-ons. Okay, so from an architecture point of view, this is how it's going to look like. So you're going to have your hardware layer, so work, your workstation, you're going to be running your OS, and then you're going to have to, to have a hypervisor. Um, and then you're going to run your node as a Linux VM. So, and that node is going to be both acting as the, as the control plane of Kubernetes and also the worker node. Uh, if we move to the three different OSs, we can see that, uh, that we are going to see for your workstation, um, we can see that it exactly, looks exactly the same. The only thing that changes is the hypervisor uh, that is HyperKit in macOS by default, KVM in Linux, and Hyper-V in Windows. But the rest, you can see, it's um, exactly the same. 
Okay, so let's have a look to, to the demo. All the demos are pre-recorded. Uh, in this same laptop, I've given the, the presentation uh, because I needed to speed up some of the stuff um, so it doesn't run for hours. Uh, so this is how it looks from a user point of view. So you can run the version. It's a simple CLI, um, CLI tool. Uh, you can check the list of clusters that you have on your workstation. We don't have any, so let's create one. Super simple. When I do Minikube start, um, it's going to create the VM for me. So I don't have to create a VM before. It's going to do that for me. In this case, using HyperGit, I'm running macOS. And it's going to start um, a cluster, a 118 cluster in this case, um, directly. One of the great things that it does is that um, as soon as you finish uh, creating that cluster, uh, it's going to configure kubectl to point to this cluster. So kubectl is the client tool that you use to connect, to, to interact with a Kubernetes cluster. And um, it's going to be configured for you automatically. So as soon as you finish doing this, uh, you can do kubectl get nodes, and it's going to point uh, directly to our to our cluster. Okay. So how does it look like? Uh, so we we are going we have deployed Datadog just to check how this looks like. So it has a, a node um, with a role master running one eighteen. We have all the logs that it's producing. Um, and if we check the list of processes that we are running inside this node, uh, we can see that um, it's a system D-based Linux uh, system. And uh, it's running DockerD as a container runtime. And it's running the kubelet. And those are running as OS processes, but the rest of the components that we need for Kubernetes uh, to run, like the controller manager, the API server, uh, the kube proxy, all of that are running as containers. So if we go to the containers list, we can see that very easily. So we are running the API server. Obviously, we are done running the Datadog agent to see all this information. Um, but we are having all these components as containers. Uh, so we have the API server, UTCD, controller manager, core DNS, et cetera. Um, obviously, we can drill down to see what command and how it's running Kube API server in general, um, but um, this is running as container and something that is important to know. Okay, so how do we access our application? One of the things that we want to do, obviously, is access and test our application. So we were saying that one of the great things that Minikube has is that it implements um, very easily uh, node port and load balancer services. So if, to put an example, we have here this application has several services and one of the services front end is exposed as a node port. Uh, in order to access that application, the only thing that we need to do is Minikube service, the name of the service, dash dash URL. Um, and if we remove the dash dash URL, um, it's going to open for us um, our default browser and it's going to load our application. So super simple way to deploy an app, expose it as a service and being able to see um, if it's running correctly. Okay, let's check the second one, Kind. So Kind obviously has the cutest name for a tool. Um, Kind um, stands for Kubernetes in Docker. Uh, and it's already giving us an idea of um, what we are going to see here. So Kubernetes in Docker is based on Docker in Docker, which means that you can, you're able to run a container runtime inside a container. So what we are going to do here is to run Kubernetes node as a container. Uh, so the container runtime of our node is going to run inside a container. We are going to see a graph to make this a little bit easier to understand. Um, kind is a project that started in 2019, so it's fairly new. Um, it's great because it works anywhere Docker works. Um, and obviously, we are going to see the trick here um, because obviously it has to be virtualized. But one of the things that Docker does is that the user experience uh, in macOS and Windows is very transparent. 
um, everything is spiritualized, but uh, they make you feel like you're running Docker natively. And we will see how it looks like in the demo. Um, it was first designed for automatic testing of Kubernetes itself. Uh, so the Kubernetes project needed obviously to be able to spin up different clusters, turn them down, test everything. And uh, it was created for that project. So that gives us, uh, if Kubernetes is using it for testing, that means that it's very good um, to include as well if we want to add it on our CI pipelines. As I said, it's using the nodes are going to be containers instead of VM, but it, they are going to be using a container image that is going to be a little bit special uh, because it's a container image that tries to look like a VM, uh, like a proper, because it's going to have system D in it, um, it's going to have its own container runtime, um, it's going to run all the Kubernetes components. So it's going to look a little bit like a VM, but it's not. And this is multi-node cluster. You, you're allowed to create several nodes for your cluster because they're super lightweight. Okay, so this is how it looks for, uh, from an architectural point of view. So you have the hardware, you have your host OS that is running the Docker runtime. And then uh, for each node for your cluster, it's going to be actual a container that gets another container runtime inside. So this is the Docker in Docker experience. Again, we know that actually this is not what is happening in some of the OSs. Um, so in macOS and Windows, everything here is virtualized. Um, but the thing is that, as I said, Docker makes it believe, makes it, well, not believe, they, they don't want to, to lie, or, but they want to make the experience uh, very good so you feel like you're running Docker natively. But actually what is really happening so they are going to create a VM for you uh, based on a distro called Linux kit. And that uh, Linux machine is the one who is going to run the Docker runtime. And then inside, your, inside that one, you're going to have the containers as nodes running a second runtime. So a little bit of layers of abstraction, but we are going to see in the demo that it's very transparent for the user. Um, kind, uh, another benefit that it has is that you can uh, define, put all your configuration in YAML files um, instead of passing them uh, on the command line. So it's very good to have all this on your, for example, on your uh, Git repo uh, to help with the CI aspect of it. In this case, for example, we are defining a cluster that has two nodes, one as control plane, one as worker, and both running Kubernetes 1.18. Okay, let's have a look to the demo. Um, so again, we start with kind version um, and we can get the list of clusters and we are going to apply this configuration to the creation command, uh, the same one that we've seen in the slides. And um, we are going to um, just kind create cluster and we are going to pass that configuration. And this is what is going to happen. Um, it's going to start creating some, some nodes. Um, it's going to install a CNI, so the networking plugin for you. In this case, it uses KindNet, which is specific to, to Kind. Um, it's going to add a storage class for you as well, which is great. And similar to Minikube for this session, it's going to make kubectl point to, to the right context. So, after this, we can just do um, kubectl get nodes and it will point to the, to the right one. Um, but uh, we've said that these are actual um, containers. So, and this is where, where you're going to see how Docker makes it very transparent because I can get the list of containers in my machine. And um, these are the two nodes, both are containers. And um, although this is actually inside a VM, I didn't have to SSH into that VM. Uh, Docker does all that heavy lifting for me. So it's super easy to, to use containers outside Linux. Okay, um, let's have a look again uh, on Datadog, how this looks like from a process and container point of view. So if we check, for example, the control plane, in this case, we have two hosts 
uh, we will see that this looks a little bit like a VM because it has systemd, it has a container D as runtime, a bunch of containers running, and it also has the kubelet. Um, so those are the kubelet and container D are the only two processes that is, are going to be running as OS processes. If we check the list of containers, um, the rest of the components that are needed for Kubernetes are going to be running as containers. So we have the API server, obviously Datadog agent to get the data, uh, controller manager, etcd, core DNS, uh, Kynet, which is um, the networking plugin. Um, and we can dig in to see um, the process information of, for example, the API server in case we want to understand how kind is uh, executing the API server, so all the arguments that it's, it's going to use. Okay, um, so how do we access our application? So um, you may think that with all these layers of abstraction, we have, um, we have the VM, then we have a container, then another container <coughs> for our application. And um, we may think that um, this is, uh, is going to be tricky to access our app, but it's again, very transparent. So for example, if you want to access this app, this uh, pod using port forward, um, it's very, very straightforward. We just do port forward and everything is done transparently. Um, we can access um, our application that we saw before. So pretty great, uh, super lightweight, uh, way of, of doing of doing cluster of creating clusters. Okay. Uh, the third one that we are going to see is micro Kubernetes, which is a little bit different in the concept of uh, maybe me and cube and kind are the most popular ones, but definitely not the only ones. So let's have a look to some others. Um, micro Kubernetes is a Kubernetes distribution by canonical uh, for developers and IoT. So it's not only meant as your local cluster, it's also meant to be deployed uh, on IoT devices. It's packaged as a SNAP, which is a packaging system uh, created for Ubuntu. Um, there are other Linux distros that support SNAPs, but really when you're talking about the SNAPs, chances are you're talking about Ubuntu. It's using Flannel as CNI. So instead of using something specific for micro Kubernetes, it's using just a simple uh, CNI plugin called Flannel. Uh, it allows to multi for multi-node cluster and it, same as Minikube, you can add several add-ons to your cluster. This is how it looks like from an architectural point of view. You have your hardware, you have Ubuntu running on your hardware. Um, it's going to be your Kubernetes node. Uh, you have a SnapD, uh, which is a daemon that you require uh, to run one of these snaps. And then you are going to have all the components that you need for your node as OS uh, processes, not as containers as we saw with Minikube and Kine. So you're going to have the kube proxy, container D, API server, Flannel, scheduler, kubel, etc. all of that as processes um, in, your, um, in your node. Um, again, if you're not running Linux, uh, this is going to be virtualized. Um, and this is when we start to be less, uh, we have to be more specific about creating the VMs. And if you go to the instructions on how to create a micro Kubernetes cluster uh, on macOS or uh, Windows, um, they recommend using Multipass, which is basically just a VM management tool that Canonical created. Uh, it's very tailored towards Ubuntu. You can really use whatever you want. If you want to use Vagrant, if you want to use VirtualBox, anything else, um, you can do so. So basically what you need is an Ubuntu VM if you're running macOS or, or uh, Windows. Uh, but because they recommend multipass uh, in the restriction, that's what I did on the demo to make it things simpler. So the first thing that we need to do is to launch an Ubuntu machine. Uh, they have this command multipass launch and it's going to launch uh, the latest um, Ubuntu LTS release by default. Um, I recorded this before um, 20.04 was released, so it's, this is going to run 18.04. Uh, 
Um, and once we launch it, we can SSH into it. Um, they call it shell, but it's basically SSH into the VM in a more transparent way. So you can see that this is uh, basically running normal Ubuntu 18.04 um, directly uh, from, from the cloud images. Uh, so let's um, install the snap. So the way we install it is with uh, snap install. Uh, this is how you install this packaging system called Snaps. And um, it's going to take a little bit while. Um, this is many of the boring things of the demo is, are a little bit speed up. So um, you, if you do that yourself, you may notice that it takes a little bit more. Um, and then once you install it, you have to wait a little bit for it to be ready. Um, so once it's ready, you can do kubectl get notes uh, using a special command called micro Kubernetes, kubectl, and then you're ready to go. Um, so this list that we see here are the list of add-ons that I was mentioning, things that you can add to your cluster in a very easy way. So they are already pre-tested to work on micro Kubernetes. Um, so let's... Uh, use this to enable DNS, uh, because DNS is something that in general you always need um, on your system. And now we are going to have a look on how it looks internally. So we have only two containers. This is, a, a still, this is already different from what we've seen before. Uh, we only have the Datadog agent that we deployed outside the recording, but uh, we deploy it. Um, and uh, core DNS that we just enabled. Where are the rest of the components? So if you go to the list of OS processes, you can see them there, like the API server, controller manager, the kubelet, container deal, um, the kube scheduler, all of that are running as um, OS processes uh, directly as system D units. Same thing, you can check uh, what are the defaults of how they run each of those components uh, easily if you navigate into the actual process. Um, and um, yeah, that's a little bit different from what I, we've seen so far. Um, another thing that it's different from what we've seen so far is the user experience. So uh, in Minikube and Kind, I was able to access my cluster without leaving my workstation. In this case, I had to SSH into the machine and I'm still on the machine. Uh, which is, doesn't seem ideal. You want to be on your workstation without having to access any um, VM directly. So the user experience is not as good as the other two, but um, you can overcome that quickly. Uh, they have a command to expose your kube config uh, into a file. So we are going to do that now. Um, and then we are going to go back to our workstation and copy that file into our local uh, file system. And once we do that, um, there is a command called transfer in multipass, which is SCP really. Um, once we do that, we can, we can um, expose our kube config and then access that same um, node, uh, that same cluster using kubectl. Uh, so it can be done. It's not a straightforward, uh, but it definitely can be done. Um, so we said this was a multi, uh, multi-node, so how we add a node. Uh, so let's SSH into the control plane. Uh, they have a command called um, add node. And that basically what it does, it gives us a token uh, that we're going to use in a second node. Obviously, if you want, these are VMs. So if you want a second node, uh, you're going to need um, basically a second, um, second VM running micro Kubernetes. So I super speed this up because we already seeing all these things. Once we have it up and running, the only thing that we need to do um, is to add that command into our uh, worker node. And once we do that, we check quickly that um, the processes that we're running here uh, look a little bit different because it's going to be a worker node. So it's only going to have the components that are needed for a worker node, like container D and Plano, kubeproxy and the kubelet, but we don't have the API server, we don't have 
um, cube controller. All of that is on our second, uh, on our second node. And if we go back uh, to our workstation and do again kubectl get nodes, uh, we can see that both nodes are up and running. So fairly easy way to add a multi-node cluster um, uh, because all the um, all the all what it's needed to secure the connection between the nodes is already done through that token. So very straightforward to do. Cool. Um, so the fourth and um, five, uh, four slash five on our list are K3S and K3D. Um, let's start by the, the original project, which is K3S, and we will explain uh, how K3D is related. Again, um, similar to micro Kubernetes, it's a lightweight Kubernetes distribution for devs and IoT devices, so very similar. Um, it was originally created by Rancher, and um, the same way that micro Kubernetes package Kubernetes as a single snap, K3S goes um, a step further and package everything as a single binary. So you only have to download a binary and you're ready to go. Uh, same as Flannel D, uh, same as micro Kubernetes, is going to use Flannel D for the CNI. And again, as well is multi-node cluster. So how does it work? Um, so we have this binary that we run in our Linux machine. And once we run the binary, and we can run it in two different ways, we can run it, uh, the first way is to run it to get a control plane node. So we run this command, k3s server, and it's going to create two processes, and only the two processes. It's going to create the container D process, and it's going to create the k3s server process. And all the components that are needed to run Kubernetes, as we've been telling all the time, the API server, control it, et cetera, uh, are going to be embedded inside that single process. So uh, very out of the box thinking when designing this thing, where they embedded everything on a single process. Um, you can see that here that you have SQLite, which is a little bit weird to have in a Kubernetes cluster usually. Um, the state is managing in ETCD, but then they wanted to make it very, very lightweight and they replaced ETCD with SQLite. Um, the K3S team is preparing a release of K3S um, with ETCD as an option, but it's still not the full. So that's for the control plane. What about if I want to add a worker node? I use exactly the same binary. The only thing that I do differently is that I run a different command called K3S agent. And it's going to create, again, two processes, the container runtime, and this process that is going to embed all the components that are needed for a, um, for a worker node, like kubelet, flannel, kubeproxy. So very, very interesting uh, cluster. Let's have a look to, to how it works from a user point of view. So this requires Linux. And in this case, it doesn't give you, it's, it's not like Minikube that is going to create the VMs for you. Um, you have to create them themselves or you, if you're not running uh, Linux natively. So you can do whatever you want. Um, I've used Vagrant for this example. They don't recommend anything in particular. Um, so I'm using Vagrant. Um, and I'm creating two, um, two VMs, exactly the same, running Ubuntu. Um, one, I'm going to call it Node, Control Plane, and they're going to be connected through um, a network. So I'm going to do Vagrant app to run it, and I'm going to SSH into the Control Plane. And once I'm on the machine, it's just a fresh installation. The only thing that I need to do is um, download a binary, a single binary that I can get from the list of releases. And when I download it, uh, what I'm going to do is just give it some execution permissions and maybe put it in a path, but nothing else. So how do I run my control plane? So it's, if I run K3S, the binary, I can see that I have two commands, the server and the agent. This is the control plane that we are trying to build. So I'm going to run K3S server. And you can see that there are many um, arguments here. And some of the arguments are not related to K3S itself. So for example, you have things like kubelet arguments and kube proxy arguments, because all of these components are going to be 
uh, embedded on this process, if you want to pass different, different arguments to, to those components, you have to through K3S. Um, in our case, the only one that I'm going to use is the Flannel interface, basically to tell the networking plugin how, what interface uh, should it use to talk to the rest of the nodes. So um, it's going to, to run this. So I'm going to leave it running in a terminal. And then I'm going to SSH again onto the same machine. And now I can do a special command called k3s kipctl get notes. Um, and I can see my node is up and running, which is, which is great. So I only had to download a binary, run it, that was it. Uh, so how does it look like from, um, from a process and containers point of view? Um, so we are um, checking the host, uh, looks like just a normal VM. Uh, if we check the, the containers, uh, we have um, some containers that are not really part of the core Kubernetes components, but uh, K3S is a little bit opinionated in the sense of what, you, what it thinks that you will need um, anyway, remember that with micro Kubernetes, uh, we needed to enable the core DNS uh, plugin to get core DNS. Uh, here is, is by default, so it has things like traffic for your ingress needs. Um, it has the metric server, which is very interesting to get the uh, CPU and memory that each pod um, is using, uh, and core DNS. So, uh, and also some uh, storage class. So all of that is done for you, but where are the processes for my components, the components that are part of the... So we can see that um, there are only two, two of them. Uh, so there are no APA server, there is no kube proxy. So the only, um, the only ones that we are going to see is the uh, K3S server and container D. And this process is the one that is going to contain uh, all those components. So something to, I think it's important to know um, how this works in case you need to debug something, uh, you need to understand where, where are those, every, all those things. Cool, uh, let's uh, do a second node. Uh, so we had this second VM that we had um, called node and we had um, download the same binary K3S and we have given um, some permissions and we are going to paste a token. Uh, we can get this token from the control plane. Uh, so it's all in the instructions and then we only have to run um, the agent command with the same binary pointing to our server and passing the token so we can communicate to the server securely. Um, and it's going to do the same thing. It's going to run that command and if I go back to the control plane and do kubectl get nodes, I can see the second node over there. So again, very straightforward to add that second node. And, and um, that, was, that was great. But um, we saw that those are not um, super transparent uh, developer experiences because we had to create those VMs we had to um, SSH into those VMs. We had to download the binary, et cetera. Um, so it doesn't seem like a great, great user experience, uh, but a lot of people loved uh, K3S for developers. So they decided to create this second project called K3D that basically is a wrapper to launch Kubernetes cluster, K3S cluster, sorry, in Docker. Uh, so, this is, seems to be looking a lot like Kine. It's the same concept, so running containers inside containers. Um, this is going to be, instead of VMs, uh, our nodes are going to be containers. Um, it's very easy to install. You only have to call bash an installation script. Uh, the only thing that does, a script does, if you check it, so it's safe to do, is check what is, um, what is your operating system and download the right binary. You want, if you want to skip cool bashing stuff from the internet, you can just go to the releases page and get the right binary. And it's also multi-node. Multi um, so let's have a look from a, a user point of view. So we've um, 
run that command to get the right binary. Um, again, that's the only thing that it does, it's going to get the right binary in the right path. And once we have that binary, um, we, we can just run the command and uh, quickly create a cluster, simple as that. And this is going to be very, very similar to what we've seen on Kine. Um, it's going to run a special container image that is going to look a little bit like a like VM. But if you run Docker PS, again, this is um, an actual container and we can see that it's running this command k3s server that we were using when we are doing k3s directly on our VM. Um, once you explore the right cube config that they have a command for, uh, you can access uh, the cluster through your um, kubectl in your workstation. So um, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, okay, so let's check um, how to add a node. Uh, so the way we add a node is super simple. Uh, we just we didn't have to, we don't have to create this second container ourselves um, and then join that that one as we did with K3S. Uh, we just do K3D add node and point to the control plane node, um, and it's going to just work. Uh, so if we do now kubectl get node, sorry about the alias. Um, you get both nodes. Uh, one of them is not ready yet because it's going to take a while. Uh, but if we run Docker PS to check the containers on our machines, we can see that we have um, the second node running K3S agent instead. So uh, if we check the list of processes, um, very same thing as K3S. We only have the K3S um, server and K3's agent um, on each of those nodes. And the rest of, of it is going to be embedded. And if we check the list of, of containers, we are going to see that it's going to have the same containers that we saw on K3S. So your local path provisioner, your traffic, core DNS. So same things that you obtain on K3S, you're going to have it on K3D, but running on a container and um, with a great developer experience. Okay, the final one that we are going to see is completely different. Um, it's, not, um, it's not really meant to be a local cluster, uh, but it's very easy to deploy and it's a little bit special. I thought it was interesting to, to put it here as well, um, if not as a curiosity. Uh, Firecube is a GitOps ready uh, cluster. So what is GitOps? Um, GitOps is a way of working uh, with infrastructure and applications where everything, um, the source of truth and everything is on a Git repo. So all your infrastructure code, your app code, your app configuration, everything is on Git. Developers or admins do not interact with Kubernetes directly, just through the Git repo and the Kubernetes cluster is going to be reading that configuration and applying the changes. So it's kind of similar um, as another concept called infrastructure as code, uh, but, the, but it goes a little bit uh, a step further, um, not only for infrastructure, but also for your app, for your app, app config, even your secrets in a special way. They have ways to add secrets as well, encrypted. Um, so uh, Firecube is an easy way to get a GitOps Kubernetes cluster. So, if you want to try keep GitOps and what it is, it's a good way to get you up and running very quickly. Uh, it's going to create your cluster using Firecracker, um, using Ignite, which is a WeaveWorks project. This is Firecube was originally developed by WeaveWorks. Um, and if you're not in Linux, it's going to fall back to Docker in Docker. So again, in my case that I'm running macOS, it's going to create these container nodes. And also it's multi-node as well. Uh, so let's see the demo. And this demo is started differently from the rest of the demos. This demo doesn't start on a terminal. It is started on GitHub. Be why? Because if this is GitOps ready, the first thing that we need is a Git repo. So we are going to do that. And this is the instructions that they ask you to do. Uh, so the first thing that you need to do is to fork the repo. Uh, 
we are going to do that. We fork the repo. Um, and then we are going to clone that repo. Um, and this new repo that we have created, that we have forked, is going to contain all the information about um, our cluster, our infrastructure. We just run setup. It's going to download some tools. This is basically a wrapper uh, for different tools uh, that they have. And this is the interesting bit. Before creating my cluster, it's going to produce some configuration here and it's going to push it to Git. So instead of creating the cluster and then maybe afterwards pushing to Git, it's going to push to Git because uh, that configuration is how my cluster is going to look like. And then um, a tool is going to read that information and it's going to create the cluster. Um, so it's going to create that cluster for you. And um, it's going to take a while. It's using ADM um, as many of these tools. So that's why you see some ADM happening here. And once you, you, you export the kubeconfig, you're getting the nodes. Um, we have two different um, containers. And what if I want to uh, deploy my application? Uh, should I do kubectl apply? Okay, that doesn't seem like the case because I want to do everything through Git. Um, so to basically what I'm going to do is to copy those manifests that I have for my application into my Git repo. And I'm going to push that to my uh, Git repo. First, I'm going to commit my changes and then I'm going to um, push to my, to my remote. So once I do that, um, I can do, I'm not doing kubectl at all here. Um, and if I get the pods uh, and I watch a little bit, in a couple of seconds, you're going to see uh, those containers appearing magically. How did that happen? It happened because Firecube comes by default with this component called Flux. Um, and this component, what it's going to do, is going to uh, watch all the time for changes on my Git repo. And uh, once that uh, it see any changes, it's going to apply those changes directly. So interesting way of working. Uh, if you want to learn about GitOps, um, you can use Firecube to get you up and running. Maybe not uh, use it as, as your usual local cluster, uh, but if you want to try this concept, it's a good way. Okay, so uh, just we are, Finishing, so some just some takeaways. Um, local clusters are not production. They don't mean to be production, um, but still they're very, very useful. They're very useful for CI, for testing, um, for learning tools. Uh, so knowing uh, what they are, I think they can be very, very useful. Um, also, I think it's important, or at least is uh, well, important needed to know um, a little bit of the architecture of your local cluster, whether it's a VM, whether it's a container, um, whether it's um, the components of Kubernetes are running up processes or containers, all these things are going to help you debug in case something goes wrong. And um, my final takeaway is that Docker in Docker is actually a good compromise. Um, running your nodes as containers is fast, it's lightweight, uh, you can have lots of clusters running on your machine. Um, so if you, uh, and that's why many of these tools are falling back, like Kind, um, we see on K3D, uh, many of these tools are using um, Docker for your nodes. And that's it, thank you very much. Um, I hope you learn a little bit um, how you, how you work with these local clusters, uh, feel free to reach out um, anytime and visit datadoghq.com if you want to, to check how you can monitor your Kubernetes cluster as well. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Ada, for a great presentation. Uh, I think we have time for one or two questions. Um, so let's just get right into that. Uh, can I install Minikube and Microkate side by side in my Ubuntu VM or will uh, kubectl get confused? Um, so um, that's a good question. You, you definitely can, you can do both. Um, what is going to happen is going, uh, so 
the way this works when you have access to several um, to several clusters is that each cluster is going to have what it's called a context. Um, so what you're going to happen to have is several contexts. So kubectl will point to each of those clusters depending on the context that you're switching. So what you will need to do is to maintain those two contexts and switch between those two depending on, on what cluster you want to talk to. Awesome. Uh, next question. In Windows Minikube, uh, which driver is good, Hyper-V or VirtualBox? Um, so both, uh, both are good. Um, if you can run Hyper-V, I, probably I would recommend it, but uh, both should work, definitely. Thank you. Uh, the next one, which flavor of local Kubernetes cluster is best suited for a team of developers using workstations that run Windows? Um, so there is no right answer to that. Um, again, those are different. Um, anything that, um, that runs on Docker is going to use Hyper-V by default. Um, Minikube have more choices. So depending on the hypervisor you want to use, um, anything that it's uh, Docker based is good. So I would say um, any of the K3D or Kine should work. Minikube should work as well. Awesome. Uh, unfortunately, there are a few more questions left, but we're running out of time. So I'm going to kind of cut us off. Um, thanks again, Ada, for a great presentation. Um, that's all the questions we have time for. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, the webinar recording and slides will be online later today. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you at future CNCF webinars. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thank you.